Let's, uh, let's start off in prayer. It's always a good place to start. Lord Father, we thank you for the opportunity to go through your word, to have a bit of fun together as a family. And Lord, that I pray that your word may, may percolate, Lord Jesus, may, may change our hearts. And Lord Jesus, I pray in your name that against any resistance, uh, that we may have any norms that we used to. I pray that you may interrupt our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everybody. Hello. Happy New Year. Uh, the, the title of my sermon is Happy Old Year. My name is Tendai Musikavanu. Try saying that, Musikavanu. Otherwise known as the pastor with the Caucasian face mic. Some of you may remember that from last year. The saga continues. No, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, hate, I shouldn't hate on my face mic. Right, um, right, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're buying a brown one. We, hold up, hold up, now stop. We already bought one, but it didn't work with our systems. We tried, all right? Still there, all right. And my spiritual response to that is, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and I'm joking, I'm joking. No, no, you know, um, <laughs> no, you can't get more diverse than a guy who was born in Europe, who is African, wearing an, a Caucasian American mic. <laughs> That's diversity right there. So here we are at the end of a year, as usual. Must be the end of the year, and I was on the stage again. No, I'm joking. <laughs> and... Um, with eager expectation looking towards a new one, right? And the words Happy New Year are going to be said more than once, I guarantee you, between now and tomorrow morning. And what do those words actually mean? In fact, can I ask a rhetorical question, which means please don't answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know some of you. Let me ask a rhetorical question. If you didn't have a happy old year, how can you have a happy new one? How was your 2017? Without God's amazing creative force interrupting our lives and changing things upside down or actually right way up, how can we expect to have a truly joyous and happy 2018? How can we make those words anything more than just meaningless banter? Just the thing that you say to each other whilst a bit tipsy, whilst waiting for that crystal ball to drop. I got a, a notification on my phone. It's uh, from a system called Bloomberg. Any asset managers or investment bankers in the house? Okay, don't look at me like that. Pastors can be investment bankers. <laughs> Wall Street needs salvation too. Okay? All right. We need some of you to come to Wall Street. But there's a system called Bloomberg where it basically masses all the information about commodities, stocks, bonds, all these assets, all these prices and nice colors on your screen. And it's supposed to be the place where everybody meets to transact. And they sent a notification to my phone, Bloomberg. And I quote directly from it. And this is, in the back of all of this is probably the bumper harvest Christmas sales year of all time, or at least one of them. Consumer confidence is at an all-time peak. And yet, this is what Bloomberg sends to my phone. It says, think 2017 was a tough year? Our pessimist guide explores the scenarios that could shape 2018 and beyond. Bar humbug. End of quote. <laughs> I don't know what humbug means. Maybe some of you guys do. But that pessimism, that lack of excitement about 2018 is permeable even in the stock market. So how do we make sense of this Happy New Year greeting? So maybe we should go into it and analyze it word by word and break it up and look at how we, what, what meaning we attribute to each one of those words, Happy New Year, and then look at how God, what meaning God attributes to each one of those through looking at the Bible. What does God say about being happy? What does God say about being new? And what does he see, say about years? So let's start off at the Oxford Concise Dictionary. I was just thinking about this. Concise dictionary, is that like opposite of being verbose dictionaries? Are dictionaries not verbose by definition? Anyway, let's just go to the Oxford Concise Dictionary. 
before I get carried away here. And it defines happy as being a feeling or showing pleasure or contentment, willing to do or accept something. And the second uh, definition is fortunate and convenient. Let me just repeat those again. So it defines happy as feeling or showing pleasure or contentment, willing to do or accept something. And the second definition is fortunate and convenient. Yet, when you read the Bible, it's a good place to start any sermon. James 1, verse 2 to 4. You can hear the clicking and the rustling of pages. James 1, verse 2 to 4. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's telling that our definition of happiness is to equate it with convenience and pleasure. Yet the Bible shows what is true to everyday life. The Bible does not have to pretend it is the truth. And what it says about everyday life and about happiness implies that if happiness was only to be equated with pleasure and convenience, that means that those times which are not pleasurable, those times which are not convenient, must be completely devoid of happiness. We have no choice but to live in that existence. It sort of explains why sometimes I have what we call solar-powered Christianity. Now, I'm a green guy just like the rest, I believe that we should be good custodians of this planet. If we can save on hydrocarbons, we should do so. But just work with me on this analogy of solar-powered Christianity. You see, solar-powered Christianity is where if the, only when there's positive circumstance shining down on us can we exhibit any power and be strong. When things are going well, when the wind is in your sails, whatever knowledge you want to give, when things are going well, that's when your Christianity shines and that's when you're powerful. But on a cloudy or rainy day, pretty much like what we've been having in New England all year, <laughs> that power goes from happy new year to happy... And then you've got the second level of Christians, some of us who have learned that we need to have some sustainability to our Christian faith, and we have learned how to sustain it. So we have a battery right there. And that battery is meant to protect us during those times when things aren't going so well. And it's an alternate source power. Maybe your favorite Bible verse, or maybe something that you say to yourself, or certain habits or patterns you've learned as coping mechanisms. I believe God has called us beyond coping mechanisms. But when you've got that battery there, it will last you through those stormy days. But here's another rhetorical question. What if that stormy day turns into a stormy week? Or stormy month? Or dare I say stormy year? What happens when even that battery runs low? What I believe the Bible calls us to when it comes to true happiness is to not rely on positive circumstance shining and radiating joy on us. It calls us beyond saving and storing energy for another day. It calls us to deviate from that sun of positive circumstance to the ultimate true sun, the infinite source of all power. For us plugging into Jesus, it doesn't matter whether there's a stormy day. It doesn't matter whether it's a stormy year or a stormy decade. You are plugged into the true source of all power. So the question is then, how do we plug into that true source of power? Well, let's go back to that verse. God is calling us to a happiness that matures through hardship. He's calling us to a happiness that lacks nothing because it is not dependent on positive circumstance, but is dependent on the Lord. It is to this happiness that all of us as children of God should aspire because it is the only thing that gives true meaning to life. 
This happiness creates its positive circumstance through the testing of faith rather than positive circumstance creating happiness. Let me say that again. Say it again, Pastor. <laughs> or as you say in Africa, if you can just say amen. Please just say amen like that. Amen. It makes me feel as I'm home, back home in Africa. Say amen. amen. Oh, back in Johannesburg. Thank you. I'll say it again. This godly happiness that we can get by plugging into Jesus creates circumstances, creates positive circumstances through the testing of faith rather than being limited to the human condition where positive circumstances creates happiness. Let's go on to the second of the three words, new. And we'll go back to the dictionary definition of the word new. You're all with me today. Anybody still digesting any turkey? <laughs> Don't worry, fasting is coming. <laughs> All right, new. How does it define new? New is being made, introduced, or discovered recently, or now for the first time, not existing before. It can also be seen, experienced, or acquired recently, or now for the first time. Or the third definition is reinvigorated, restored, or reformed. Now, I think you can see what's coming. Let's hear what the Bible defines newness as. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 to 10. It says, what has been will, will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. And just to make this interesting, let me add yet another verse. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. He is good pleasing, and perfect will. Now, these two verses seem to be in contradiction. Does the Bible ever contradict itself? Anyone want to answer that? That is not rhetorical. No, no. It never contradicts itself. The only thing the Bible ever contradicts is our lives when they're not, live, when they're not according to the truth, when we live fake lives. That's when the Bible contradicts because the Bible confirms truth. Truth confirms truth. Any trial lawyer will tell you that when you've got a witness in the stand and you're busy badgering them, the reality is if that person's telling the truth, what they say will confirm either what they've said before or what other people have said. But if they're lying, or if someone's lying, there'll be a contradiction. No, these verses are contradicting them, each other. Really just giving us two aspects of the same truth about newness. What we can distill from these verses is that nothing in creation is new. In fact, does that sound anything like Newton's first law of thermodynamics? That is not a contradiction. That is not a coincidence. There's nothing on this planet, nothing in creation that can be created or destroyed. That is not a coincidence. But there is one exception that God has made. And that is our minds. Our minds and our souls can be renewed. What's amazing about that is God has created our minds and our souls for eternal purposes. And that's why I believe he made us, made it an exception to that rule. Um, let me just quickly find out. Um, I'll just skip my place here. So when you look at the fact that our minds and our, our hearts and our souls can be renewed, what it, what it means is each one of us have an opportunity every single year to enter that same year as we've always done and be surprised why the year turns out exactly the same. Or we can allow ourselves to be transformed. We can be new. And when we're new, the year will be new. You see, that is the only thing, that is the only way we can actually transform these years is through our minds. But when that verse talks about the pattern of this world, what is it meaning then? The pattern of this world is a pattern of lifeless repetition. 
repetition, deceiving all of us that do so, that we're progressing when we're just going around in circles. Convincing us that what is dead is alive. This is a reason why most New Year's resolutions do not work. Because if you are not new, your year's, your year's not going to be new. Let's talk about dieting. <laughs> Let's talk about exercise. <laughs> Let's talk about making your bed. If your heart or approach to food, health, and cleanliness has not changed, then I guarantee you nothing will change. But only when our hearts are transformed does anything new even begin to happen. That is why, unless our minds are changed, 10 years experience is not really 10 years experience. It's one year experience repeated 10 times, over and over again. This is why the more powerful gravitational pull of Jesus needs to be at the center of our universe. Otherwise, each of us will just orbit around our favorite sin over and over again. Talking about orbit, let's define year. What does a year mean? Well, the first definition is the time taken by the earth to make one revolution around the sun. And then it goes into the definition of a calendar year or civil year, saying it is 365 days, starting from the 1st of January, uh, and used for reckoning time in ordinary affairs. Uh, then it talks about an, an age, or it talks about a set of students grouped together as a year. But before we start talking about these arbitrary demarcations that we call a year, let's just take a break and go back to my childhood which was in London, and we used to have Playhouse, or as it, when I later moved on to Africa, they used to call Playhouse Mahumbre. I don't know what you guys uh, call it here, but that is where you have a pretend house, and this is the sitting room, and that's the kitchen, and this is the bedroom, and this is a chocolate pie, and it's really a mud pie, and you're forced through all sorts of manipulation and guilt to eat it. It's chocolate, eat it! <laughs> Eat it! If you don't eat it, I'm going to tell mom what you did last week. Eat it! So you eat that chocolate pie and you get tape. I'm sorry, I'm going down that. Um, <laughs> now, the beautiful thing about that fantasy world of playhouse, whatever you call it, is those demarcations we put all were real. At some stage, you begin to imagine yourself the father. You begin to imagine yourself the mother. In fact, Gail's dad told her never to marry the kid who says... And I'm the wild beast that eats everybody. He said, don't marry that kid. <laughs> Thankfully, she listened. <laughs> but that's what we do with our lives. We have these arbitrary demarcations that are really meaningful to us. First of January, the Chinese calendar has equivalent. Whatever calendar it is, we have these demarcations we put, and we believe that as we step into them, something Amazing and transformational is going to happen. Yet the older you get, I'm 45, you begin to realize that this is a fairy tale just like Santa. Oh, no, okay. Uh, oops, no, sorry, Bobo, sorry, Bobo, ignore that comment. <laughs> ignore that comment. We begin to realize that these demarcations are arbitrary. So, how do we make them not arbitrary? Let's go back to the Bible. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 4 to 8. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1, verse 1, 4 to 8. It says, Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and returns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams come from, there they return again. This I find interesting that the Bible says this. Next verse. All things are wearisome. More than one can say. 
The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. This is written by someone anointed with wisdom, a preacher, and preachers often considered to be Solomon. This world without Jesus is monotonous. Or as Shakespeare said, as insipid as the white of an egg. So then, how do we break out of this monotony? How do we break out of this arbitrary revolution around this ball of fire called the sun being on this mud ball that we call planet Earth? The only way we do so is by allowing God to interrupt. Luke 4, verse 18 to 19 let me give you the backdrop to this verse I'm about to read. A carpenter's son walks into the synagogue. Imagine the synagogue as being the confluence of everything that is holy. It is a confluence of education, the brightest students. So it's pretty much a bit like, I suppose, Cambridge. <laughs> but everything that was dignified and holy and learned was at the synagogue. And in walks his carpenter's son, and he reads this verse. And after he's read the verse, he says that this messianic verse is fulfilled in their hearing through him and sits down. Now, I used to think when Jesus sat down after reading it, it meant, I'm done. It's like a mic drop. But what God, Jesus was doing was as he was sitting, in those days, that's what a rabbi did when he wanted to give a lecture. He didn't stand, he sat. And he was about to teach them who he was and about to teach them life. But let me Go into this verse rather than preempting it. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This verse is calling us to be anointed, in other words, to let the Holy Spirit settle on us, come into our hearts, to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, in other words, to be changed, to become new, and only once we ourselves are new can we begin to live a new and amazing life. Only then can we transform. If we allow Jesus to be the center of our universe, rather than ourselves, or our idols, or our favorite sins, life becomes far more interesting. Life becomes far more meaningful. By allowing him to be first, everything else falls in place. It doesn't matter how compulsive, obsessive one is to have things in order. Things will always seem out of order. It doesn't matter how creative and artistic you may be. Things will always seem out of order until God is put first in our lives, and then by some amazing force, everything falls into place in its correct order. That's what makes us have a happy new year. That's what makes our year meaningful. Now, this is not just the way I'm summarizing things. This is what the Bible says. Matthew 6, verse 33 to 34. You'll notice I'm quoting from the Bible to show that Pretty much all of these statements I'm saying are biblical. Matthew 6, verse 33 to 34, it says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Should I say it again? Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Isn't that a coincidence? We're reading this on December 31st. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I told you the Bible is real. It says each day has got trouble, but it says don't worry about it. And the way you don't worry about it is by putting Jesus first. Jesus first. 
dare I say, not America first, not South Africa first, not me first, but Jesus first. Only when you have Jesus first will there really be peace on earth as Miss World wants there to be. So how do we summarize everything we've said? What do we take home with, with us today? Well, the first point, remember that saying, Happy New Year. The first point, happy. Be happy whether convenient or pleasurable or not. By being plugged into the sun, the eternal happiness. The second point we should walk away from, or walk away with rather, is new. Let your years, whether they feel old or new, be renewed. Not because of circumstance or a Sharovsky crystal ball falling down in Times Square, but by each one of you being renewed, each one of us being renewed. Each year and season marking a deeper maturity in our walks with God. That's newness. And then year. What do we say about these demarcations we call a year? Well, when we let the creator of all time and all space have his correct space and place in our lives, and that is obviously number one, then everything cascades in place and we can shine. What was a dull year can become an amazingly brilliant year. Lives can be made meaningful Purposes and destiny is met, and we have an exciting year. This last verse we read talked about the year of the Lord's favor. May we every day let God transform us into a circumstance-free, happy new us, and then we'll have more happy new years. Let us all be set free from looking for a happy year in order to make us happy. Let us start off by having godly happiness in us and transform those years into happy years. Let's pray.